So, welcome. Uh, I just wanted to say a few words uh, about us here. First, I, I work at a company called Kuro. We sit together with Intuino, who, who are the ones occupying this place. Us in Kuro sits beyond that gate. Uh, uh, they are a design and uh, design and development studio, and we come more from a development and process perspective. Um, we don't do business together, we're not formally related, but we try to, to coexist and, and we complement each other quite well. Um, so welcome to, to our place. Fun to see that so many could make it and we actually got everyone through the doors and all the locks and everything. So that's as good. far as you know. As far as we know. <laughs> <laughs> the worst thing is when we find someone in the staircase tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Outside is okay. Uh, yeah, so me and Daniel thought we should speak a bit about SDL and Boost and Qt and so on? Yeah. Yes, and uh, we have a, a way of a particular focus about handling Boost uh, uh, dependencies between objects and uh, event handling, basically, which is something Qt is quite good at. And we, my thought was also to see if there were other alternatives without Qt, because they come with some overhead, you can say, among yeah. other things. <laughs> so if there is some way to do this in the standard C++ way. So we have some options for that, so which is briefly. We go through briefly. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, abstract. Ourselves? Uh. Yes, yep. me, myself, and I. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> My name is Daniel, and I've been working with C since 2005, I think. And I've been using Qt since 2012, so I've been in both worlds and using it right now as well. Uh, yeah, working in the software development industry since 20 years. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean that's how we met in a Qt project. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm Johan and I've been more Qt focused, you could say, uh, over the years. Uh, I worked at Trolltech briefly before ELOP happened. Mm. Ten months I clocked and then uh, no more. Uh, but I've continued using Qt over the years uh, and I've written some resources about it. So people sometimes recognize my name from Dotter Magazine, which is sort of my hobby writing there. So I have the old article. Very rarely about Qt though. Uh, I also host a, a conference here in town called FOSS North. So sneaky, sneaky, but please check out fossnorth.se when you're down here. Yeah, and for kind of I maybe like Trotic is the company that founded or came up with Qt from the beginning, the Qt yeah. framework. If and then it has been metamorphosing through different companies. Yeah. yeah. So I worked at Nokia Development Framework AS, which was Trolltech earlier. <laughs> Changed names many times. Now they're called the Cute Company. Um. Yeah, we have some kind of agenda. Uh, we'll show the problem we want to solve. It's basically the observer pattern. I guess many people are familiar with that. We look how this is can use Qt to do this. And we also look at the Boost library called Signals 2 and a prospect to boost called Synapse, which has some other features. Um, yeah, that yep. was the sort of thing. So, um, in general, if you have two objects you want to connect, we want to have loose connections to try to um, listen for events rather than polling or something like that. Uh, we can have a publisher and many subscribers. Um, and it goes through interfaces rather than tight coupling. So the dependencies is loosened up with interfaces, basically. So if you change, and this is formalizes the observer pattern, uh, where we have a subject we want to listen to, and we have an interface where we can get updates, which is implemented by the subscribers, basically. I guess you're familiar with the pattern. And a concrete way of doing this would be to have a, a subject that helps us managing the subscriptions, and then we have some implementation, like a news producer, and we have consumers who implement the update interface that registers for updates basically. And by doing so we have the news producer doesn't know where the consumers are or what type they are or whatever. They just call the update function of the observer interface basically. That is then there they also loosen the connection dependency between these. And looking at this from a Qt perspective we realized when going through the, the slides that basically Qt has a base class that provides a generic subject observer interface basically. So, just to relate the two concepts to each other. Mm. Which leads us into Qt. Lucky me. 
So, so in Qt, this is called signals and slots. Uh, that, that's sort of the terminology that they use. Uh, and, and they have a base class called QObject that, that supports this. And it also supports properties and some introspection and, and object ownership. And then just looking at the feature set that they built in the QObject, you should know that Qt was developed mid-90s when Java was hot. So, so you can say that they, they have the features of Java but in C++ and, and sort of that's what they did in their base class and then they built the UI framework around that that was very successful. Um, all of this resides in the Qt core module so, so you don't carry the whole weight of, of Qt for it but only the, the very central module which is still a lot heavier than, than for instance SDL. Yeah, just looking quickly at the at the Q object example, I, I put together a person uh, that you can change the name of, and it can tell the rest of the world that the name changed. So that's the observable part. Uh, and then I went full in and actually declared that as a property to show how how it connects together. But I I thought I'd show this step by step. So you start by inheriting Q object. The, the very base class of basically everything that isn't just data in, in Qt. Uh, there is actually a lightweight alternative called QGadget uh, that does parts of it, but not what we're talking about today. Signals and slots, uh, but everything else. Uh, and then you have this QObject macro that populates tables uh, that allows us to do this in C++ to look up what properties are there, what functions are there to dynamically call a function based on a string. So as you can send it the name, uh, the set name string, and, and place a call. The magic, the sort of lookup tables, sits up there behind that macro. Going further, I spoke a bit about object ownership. Every Q object has a parent, uh, and parents kill their children when they're destructed. <laughs> it sounds terrible, but it's very convenient as a developer. Um, so. You pass it along here, and then in the constructor, you actually pass it to the base class, and it just magically works. Uh, which means that when you do UI development, for instance, if you bring up a window, the window is the parent of all its contents, and then you only need a pointer to the window. You don't have to care about anything else. So it's, it's quite convenient, actually. Um, then we come to, to the magic parts. So you have two new sections here. Or, or rather you have four new sections if you look at Qt because you can have public, protected and private slots which are basically callable functions uh, your, your callbacks but they, they don't connect to anything at its state uh, and then you have the signals which is what you connect your, uh, your callbacks to so to speak so, so when inside this class somebody calls this function it will call anything that's connected to it so that's the observer pattern, but it's it's a bit more generic. Uh, and then, of course, this is this isn't magic. The C++ hasn't been extended. It's just a preprocessor. So slots will actually disappear when you compile this. Um, and then that means that this is just a public function, just that we told it to list it up in, in what goes into the Q object macro. Uh, the signals, however, you may not implement because they are implemented by a code generator that also generates the QObject macro contents. So that's how it works. It's just ordinary C++ functions, just that you don't write all of them. Uh, there is also something called QInvocable if you want to have a function that you can call dynamically, but isn't a slot per se because a slot is also a setter function, sort of by, by convention. Uh, and if you have a function that's more of an action function, like update or kill person or whatever you want to do with this one, uh, it would make sense to tag it as an invocable, just to say that this is not a part of the property. And again, it works the same way. It, it takes the name and puts it into the QObject macro so that you can look it up at one time. Then I decided to put these together into a Q property, and, and this is not necessary for the signals and slots. Uh, but it's kind of convenient. So for, forever, since like the 90s, you've had these triplets of, of like a getter and a setter and a change signals. And they, they've had a naming policy around that. Uh, and then you start binding Q to, to dynamic languages like QML and JavaScript and Python and so on. And then it actually makes sense to say that this is just a property name. It, it's not a function. It's a property or an attribute of, of the object. And then you simply tell Qt 
how it reads and writes and what happens when it changes. Uh, and that's just more introspection that can be used when integrating with other languages. So has anyone here used QML? Mm. I see a few hands. That's how it works, basically. Uh, they, they look it up that way. There's a new PySide module, by the way, that also, also uses it, which is really nice. So then you extend C++, but you don't really extend C++, so to speak. I mean, th this is prior to all the modern C++ standards. This is back in Visual Studio six times that this was, was set. And you try to do these tricks. Um, and the, the trick is really to populate this Q object macro. Uh, and what they do is they have something called the meta object compiler that produces another CPP file in parallel to, to your CPP file. So, so you write your ordinary class up here, and then <coughs> this one generates a hideous table of, of your function names as strings and function pointers to them, uh, but also implements all the signal functions so that they call whoever is connected to them and keep track of connections as one. Well. And I mean, from here on, we're in pure C++ land. Then the ordinary compilers and everything work. Does it mean that you don't write any Qt related stuff in the CPP? Or you can't use those macros? Or all the macros goes into the Hebify? You can actually do it that way. Uh, and then you get a .mock file, which is a CPP file. But it's just an ugly flow if you want to save yourself from writing a header. Uh, okay. So I left it out. But technically, the mock knows how to do that. All you do is that you build a table outside of the of your code that sort of points into your code, um, and that's the whole trick. So, and this you can always open one of these, and then you actually see the table of, of these are the names, these are their argument types, and these are the function pointers. Um, so it's it's very basic, actually, uh, a lot more basic than, easy. than than templates and so on. So then, how how does this then look? Uh, Practically, so, so I create a person from our person object uh, with name Kalle, uh, and I create a, a Q label, which comes from, from Qt. So these classes only share Q object as the common base. The, there is no relation between them. The person doesn't know that Q label exists. Q label doesn't know the person exists. So they're loosely coupled. Uh, and then I can do it with the old syntax. So you can say this name changed signal that takes a Q string is connected to the label slot set text that takes a Q string. That, that's how you used to do it. And then these are actually strings that uh, that the connect call parses for both objects in the lookup tables and, and makes the connection on, on a function pointer level, which means that this breaks at runtime and, and not at, at compile time. So as C11 matured and, and gained popularity among compilers, uh, this newer syntax was introduced, where, where you can instead, there should be an ampersand there, sorry for writing code directly into the slides, but found the bug. Uh, you basically have the, the two function pointers or references uh, instead, which means that it, it catches any mistakes when it comes to types and so on, or that the function doesn't exist and things like that at compile time, which is nice. Uh, this also means that this is more or less a, a function object or a functor. So, so you can hook it up to lambda as well, which is kind of nice. Because in many, many cases you use do some glue, glue code in there. And, and then this is a very convenient way to do it. Um, a typical example is if you want to write a calculator and you have the buttons 0 to 9. Using this old syntax, you had to have methods saying button zero click, button one click, and so on, and then realizing and turning it into a string, so to speak. Well, here you can put that into your lambda, and you avoid having to declare 10 functions for 10 buttons, and so on. Um, this also means that when you overload, uh, it can become ambiguous, since you, well, the automated type conversion can, can result in multiple results. So you actually have a macro called Q overload, where you can specify the signal or the signature of these specifically. So you can say that I really want something that takes a Q string. That's called set text, and then you enforce it to, to call one of the over overloaded functions. Uh, this requires C plus plus fourteen. They they have a bunch of classes to support it for C plus plus eleven, but that's that's more of a messy 
messy situation. Um, and then when you build these trees and sort of build your own framework around Qt, you can also connect signals to signals because a signal is just a function that you haven't written yourself. Uh, so if you have a signal that you want to propagate, you don't need to have a function in between. You can just propagate it through through another connection. Um, looking at the other half of this, um, you can disconnect in, in a number of ways. Uh, so you can explicitly disconnect using both syntax. You can say, I want to disconnect everything between these two objects. And, and you can do that based on the center object and say, that I want these are basically the same. Um, and, and you can disconnect everything connected to a specific signal. Uh, so you can remove all your dependencies without knowing who has connected to you. And again, these two are the same. Uh, or you can disconnect everything from an object. Uh, absolutely everything. Uh, one of the tricky parts here is that these sort of more explicit disconnects requires you to know what you disconnect from. So, so you can't really get at the lambda that way which is tricky, then, then you really need to have these broader stroke disconnects, which might not be what you want in all cases. Uh, you can, of course, create the variable pointing to the lambda and keep track of that variable, because then you can refer us back to it and, and, and disconnect it. Uh, but then you lose some of the, the convenience of having a lambda in there from the beginning. Um, I think it was... The good is that the QoBit destructor cleans up all the connections to other yeah, exactly. So, so, so when it kills its children, it also disconnects everything and then so on. So it's it's clean. So you don't have any dangling connections. Yeah. Actually, you have to have uh, on the last line there. You have to have an additional argument to get the lambda to get disconnected. Ah. It takes a pointer to the owner that should oh. destroy the lambda. Ah. So that's cool. uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Again, good to know when writing the direct yeah. chain to PowerPoint. <laughs> That's how you code. <laughs> good point. Well, what's that? Is it a fourth argument or is it a different argument? No, it's in the where you have the lambda name changed. It should be an additional argument before the lambda that says this is the when that. that ah, okay. Gets so you should have the the, 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 the label or the person or the this or yeah. the whatnot. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Um, you can also shoot yourself in the foot quite dramatically using lambdas, which I've discovered, since you can capture things that sit on the stack when doing this, and the call to your callback will not happen when that stack frame is valid, and then it just blows up spectacularly, and you have no idea where. That's fine. Um, so that's a bit tricky. Um, and then speaking of that, actually, uh, one, Qt is slightly fatter than the alternatives because they make certain choices and implement it. So it's, it's kind of convenient as long as you follow the pattern. And one of the things that they do is that they actually implement, they define a main loop and they implement it. Uh, it's an abstraction on the platform main loop. Um, so for Windows, you use the, the Win32 main loop. On Mac OS, you use something Mac specific. And on Windows or Linux, you use glib, unless you explicitly say, I don't want glib, and then you fall back onto sort of a handwritten cute event loop. Um, but by choosing to have an event loop, uh, they become sort of thready aware because each thread has a main loop. So every queue object has what's called thread affinity. You can ask the method thread of queue object which thread does this object belong to. And you can move them between threads and so on, but you, they know which thread they belong to. Uh, and then you have a meta type system that allows you to serialize the arguments on your signals which means that you can make connection across thread boundaries and not really care about it. All, all that happens is that the, the calls will become asynchronous. So you emit the signal, and when it returns, you don't know if everything has happened that's related to that signal. So, I mean, you can seriously hurt your foot again, but it's, uh, it's very convenient, uh, especially in, for instance, UI code, when you can just post a new request to, to a worker background thread and things like that. Uh, also, there is a secret argument or a default argument at the end of the connect calls. Um, so, so usually you set the connection type to auto, and then it looks, is it the same thread? Then we just make it into a function call, so then it's blocking. Uh, if it's multiple thread, we put it in, we serialize all the arguments and push it over to the other main loop when it happens, when it happens. 
but you can also set it to blocking queued, which means that it serializes it, pushes it over, but it also blocks until all the threads has processed the, the actual signal. Depends a bit on, on, on what you want. Uh, you can also OR this. Uh, these are sort of exclusive, uh, but this can be ORed onto this. This is a, a binary flag reg register, basically. You can OR in something called unique, which means that you don't have to sort of pay attention to if you make the same connection multiple times if you're swapping your code. You can make sure that you make sure there is only one connection. Because otherwise you would get multiple calls to the same callback because well it's used to fall over whatever happens to be connected. Um, another fun thing with the main loop and when we talk about destruction is is delete later, which is really convenient when you try to but when you use signals and slots, you end up being very component-based, so to speak, and you, you define interfaces, and every signal is really a hook that you can hook something into. And when you destruct through such a sequence, you, you can actually say, delete later. So, I don't need this object anymore, but perhaps someone else does in, in this call chain around this component that I don't really know, or it could be that someone else in this inheritance tree needs it during the destruction. So tag it for deletion, but don't delete it. And then it's deleted once you hit the main loop. So once that call stack is through, the object goes away. Um, you said that the objects are thread aware. Are they uh, allocated on thread specific storage, or is it on the global? You can move them around, so I would assume. They're not thread specific storage. Okay. Uh, I don't know 100%, but I think there is a separate class to handle thread-specific storage, which would tell me that this is on a global heap. Uh, I don't, I can't swear on it. Um, yeah, and this then, when doing destructions, really means that you don't have to have these stages that let everyone talk to the object while it exists. So sort of a pre-delete, and now we do the delete, and you can all synchronize again. So you can remove some sync points. So it's Again, you, you can be more convenient in the way yet, that you write your, your destruction sequences. And then, I mean, since the topic is the observable pattern, more or less, the, the Q object is really a, a generic observable. Uh, it's just that you generate the table through the mock of what you can actually observe. Um, so a signal is the point that the callbacks are connected to, and the slots are the callbacks. And I mean, that's the way to look at them. Co comparing to GTK, the slots always have uh, the context of an object, so they, they can't exist in sort of the global namespace. Well, a lambda could potentially do that. Um, but you, you want an object context, who was the slot connected to? Uh, and you also get a bit more, so compared to just having the the C++ based systems where you run through the compiler stages and everything is generated and you drop all the information you don't need. Here you keep the name of things so you know what properties there are. You can convert an enumeration to strings without writing your own switch cases. Uh, you have these property concepts that puts these triplets together. Uh, as a concept you can really tell the system that name is not only the name function, it's the setter function and the changed signal as well. Um, it knows about the inheritance tree, which was important back in, in uh, Visual Studio 6 days, again. Uh, so you could actually check, do I have a common denominator, so you can do upcasts safely, because that was hard to do on, on Windows back in those days. Um, it has a list of available methods and so on. And, and all of this is nice when you want to bind to uh, to other languages. It's not that relevant from, from the C++ perspective until you do something really generic, so to speak. But then you're almost sort of in language binding territory anyway. Uh, but it does carry all the introspection that, that Java did introduce back in the 90s. I I think that's the last slide on Qt. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, Qt can solve the problem we have, and it adds a lot of other things as well, which we could be good. <laughs> but if you want just kind of an abstract abstraction of the callback mechanism, you can use some library, for example, from Boost. <coughs> so I'm looking into Boost a bit, which is a, uh, yeah, free portable C++ library. I guess many people know about it already. It's a kind of a go-to place if you want some 
<laughs> some uh, nice functionality. Um, they provide reference implementations also for uh, the boost for the new standard C++ standards. And they are part of the library technical specification of the standard, so they are kind of tightly connected with the C++ standardization connected the way. And uh, sometimes also feel that it's kind of incubated for new C++ library features like threads and so on. It's basically carbon copy from boost, I think, the standard versions of it. Yeah. yeah. So within uh, boost there is actually a library called signals2 which actually helps to be the abstractions basically that's uh, instead of implementing this observer or subject yourself you can use this library where there are basically two objects we have a signal object and we have a connection object and uh, the signal object is a, a template object so you pass in basically the signature that must be fulfilled by the receiver of the signal itself so in this case it's a function that returns void and takes a float and an int as an input. So when you do a connect you have your method or your function or function object or lambda or something must uh, fulfill that signature. Uh, and then you do this uh, connect uh, where you need to have used the bind signal to bind it to this object. Uh, and then you have the have your connection that's the basic building box of this library for this. Uh, a simple example to tie back to the consumer example earlier on the slides. So let's say we have a news producer who wants to have a signal called news update. We can define a signal like like this. It's a trans voice and uh, it takes a string as an in parameter. Uh, you can do it uh, like this, or you can use an alias. It's much clearer to read. So that's basically what this does. It's just a a modern type of. <laughs> Um, you also have uh, the slot type which you need to actually connect to the, the signal and that is provided by the signal object itself. Uh, then you can provide a connection method where it takes this slot type as an input. Uh, it connects to the signal object like this. <coughs> and you have to have a signal object in your object. That's, that's the one, the kind of the subject in the, in the previous model. So that's, that obviously keeps track of all the subscriptions for you. So that can be in a way convenient. So if all the signals you need to define, you need to provide like an interface for that. Uh, and the client. Um, can get a producer like an input in this case. And then it can connect subscriber. And then it sends in its function it wants to as a handler for the signal, which is private in this case, and so it takes a string as an input and puts out the update basically in this case. It has to save the connection because when it's disconnecting it has to do it on the on that connection object basically. They can be managed also if you use the shared connection. There are some other variants of these objects in the library so you can use a shared connection and then um, the signal are aware of all the connections and we boost them and so on, so you don't risk any up with dangling connections here either. But uh, you have to make a choice and know what you're doing in, in a, <laughs> another, another level here, I guess. Uh, and a simple output would be to create two consumer objects, connect them, uh, produce and publish an, an update, and calls both these consumers then. So that basically handles just the kind of the subject part of the server pattern. So it's quite convenient in that way, I think. But it doesn't have all the things that Qt has with introspection and all those kind of things. Uh, and also it doesn't handle this thread handling. Um, um, yeah, we can, we, I'll come back to that. <laughs> uh, but what it can do, that Qt doesn't, is that it can handle return time <coughs> from the from the handlers of its signals, so it can kind of do something with the results. So if you have 10 subscribers, it can accumulate all result values or something, or log them or something like that, so it can handle the return values in a way, which can be neat. Um, it's also possible to say that I am connected to the signal, but I don't want any updates for a moment. You can kind of block uh, the signal for that particular subscriber, and then you can <laughs> unblock it again. If, for example, you're busy and don't want to be disturbed or, or something like that in your object. So, so another feature. Um, <coughs> so, 
understanding the results, yeah. You can, um, when you create a, okay, this is not on this uh, slide, no. What you can do when you um, create your signal, you can put an extra object in there, uh, which basically have a, a function object which takes two input integrators. So when, the, when everything is, is called, it connect, uh, connects all the uh, results, basically, so you have a list. And then that list you can go through in this aggregator object from the signal and then do something. In this case, it just prints out the different results. So this is called this beginning and iterators, when the signal has called all the subscribers, basically. Could you build a list of all the results that before this is invoked? It's no, it's implicit. Okay, so it's done as yeah. the calls are made. Yes. Yep. I presume. Uh, so then if you define a signal, then you call in this uh, aggregate and what kind of container you want the results in, basically. So you add, an, you add a parameter when you create a signal. So in this example we have two different subscribers, one that calculates the content and product sum the difference and all are connected to the same signal. We trigger this signal by just calling the sig no emit or some other weird keyword. <laughs> we just call the object like a functor and send the values. And this will basically uh, copy the results out to the O stream in this case through the aggregator object. So, mm -hmm. so it could be useful maybe in tests or something like that, for example. Uh, some limitations of this. I think it's this uh, handling of threads like Qt can do. You can trigger a signal in one thread and then it goes on a message passing mechanism basically to a receiving thread and you can handle it that. So you can connect the threads and let them read and run in parallel. There is nothing support for that in Boost uh, by Signals 2. You have to do that yourself if you want that kind of mechanism. So it's a little bit more work. Um, that I think is a big disadvantage yeah, compared to Qt because I think that is a very nice feature of Qt. Um, so, so, so up signals too. Uh, it provides a framework for your callback mechanism or subscribe mechanism. If like you, you don't have to write a boilerplate or stuff, it can be convenient. Uh, and it's not as flexible as Q objects where you can connect things by name and do those kind of things and introspection and meta type information and so on. So it's lots thinner like that, but I think this library is like a couple of hundred lines of code, so I think. <laughs> so I mean, it's it kind of more lightweight in a way. Cute core. I, I checked on my on this machine. It's uh, I don't know if I stripped it of signal stuff or uh, symbols, though, but it's around five megs. And I mean, it pulls in the glib for the main loop and so on. So it's, it's quite heavy for only signals and slots, so to speak you need to use more for it to make sense. I guess this is in the kilobytes or yeah. hundreds of kilobytes range, so to speak. Yes. Is that here? That is here. <laughs> I will handle that. <laughs> okay. And also, this transfer control between threads is not uh, available in the same way. You have to do it up yourself. But, uh, what happens if um, one of your callbacks calls uh, this uh, and subscribe. So let's say you, you have a list of call, uh, callbacks mm -hmm. in the middle of it. One of your callbacks destroys more than, let's say, the next one. Mm -hmm. Is it? Yeah, there's also where this uh, shared connection comes in, I think, where you get shared pointers to all the mm -hmm. connections. Okay, so, so, so there is a way for the signal to keep track of these kind of shared objects. Maybe that is the, the solution, but I don't really know actually how, how it's handled. But you have to, to choose in a way if there is a risk that you kind of destroy your fellow objects or something like that. And so that's how they handle it. They have two versions basically. One with shared connection where you get a share pointer to the connection object, I think. But so you have to really... Yeah, you have to think about these things when you use it in a way, because you can do uh, bad things. So, then I found this other library called Synapse, uh, which kind of claims that it can handle this kind of thread uh, management and transfer of control between threads. So I thought, I thought that was interesting, so I looked into it, and it's a prospect for being included in Boost, it's been submitted for review. 
but no one has reviewed it yet <laughs> since the last three months. Mm -hmm. I don't think they made a try in 2016, but it was rejected, so I don't know really about the quality of this library, to be honest. And um, they have some funny stuff going on, but um, uh, yeah, it's kind of similar, they solve the same problems, but they also have this kind of third, uh, aspect. You can have a look. I have not been able to try this, unfortunately, hands-on, so this is kind of a theoretical <laughs> discussion and uh, description of what documentation says. So. Um, when defining a, uh, a signal in Synapse, uh, you basically do like, do like this. Uh, you have a basic thread and then you can connect a function point to basically, where you actually get the name of the signal like this. And you have an in parameter there. So the two signals that look basically the same, but they have different names. So that's how we distinct them from each other. Um, when emitting a signal, you call the Synapse emit with a type and then the uh, value for the parameter value. Um, so an example would be like you have a click signal on some button. Uh, when that is clicked, you emit the clicked. We have this, one, this point here, I'm not sure how that is handled because the, this, this signal doesn't have limit symmetry. Um, they also promote that you should put all the signals outside of your objects, basically, so you can have like same signals can be used from different objects, and you can also add signals to existing objects easily. That's the, kind of the, the argument. So you can define a signal somewhere, and then you can use it within the class. So in contrast to Qt, where they need to be defined in the within the class, so the mock compiler can build up the understanding. Oh, you don't have to do that here. You can put them anywhere <laughs> and connect them. Um, and we can see also we have a dialog that's actually kind of the handler for this clicked signal. So if you connect and you do it like this, you have the emitter, uh, which is the button, uh, and you have a, a receiver, which is the dialog in this case. And you make them the shared pointers. Then you do this connect with the signal type, uh, the emitter of the receiver object, and also the kind of slot that should be called. Okay, so it's kind of a similar way of doing it. Uh, I think this is more, um, it's not as uh, type safe, I would say, as maybe signals 2 or cute or something, because I think this is like void, void pointers. The input of this is like void, you can send in whatever you want, basically, in this connect. And it all means if you don't connect, you will have dangling shared pointers hanging around. You mean like here? Yeah? yeah, I mean, if you're intended to be allocated in it, or you don't use it anywhere, but if you have a connection somewhere... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that would be hold true, yeah. Uh, actually, other way around. Yeah. So as I said, the emitter can be any type. Um, they are not tied to the emitting objects. You can define them anywhere and use them. Uh, and as I said, the author of this library argues that it's a good thing because then you can avoid the mock. He actually has an example where he implements a cute application basically with, with these uh, synopsis signals instead of the regional signals. So it's possible to use them together. That's what you can conclude from that, at least. Um, yeah, and it does provide a convenience object for handling this kind of transfer of uh, control between threads, which is called a thread local queue. And this is also a little bit magic, but... So, usually if you um, use different thread, thread to connect, uh, it's, it will still run and it's in the concept of the emitting thread, basically. So you call all the operations. So the threads are really not aware that's in another context. However, this local queue thing... Um, you can have a queue in your thread where you... Uh, add the, uh, the signal basically, then you can be in your thread and holding this queue and then call, uh, do the emits locally, so to speak. So you get the local and then call your slots within your thread context. Um, the documentation suggests that this is kind of automatic basically. So if you have a thread that has created a thread local queue, uh, this will happen by itself. I don't believe that, but I believe it's a uh, a convenience object where you can actually wait on. So it's a wait 
uh, operation, for example. You can wait on the queue and get information into it. And then you can process it. So you have a, a post for putting stuff in there, you have a poll and you have a wait. So you can wait for things to get into the queue. And I think you have a, like a connection that have to put something in the queue and then the third that is blocked on it. So I think you have to manage it basically by yourself, like you do in Sinus 2, but they have at least a mechanism for it that you can use. But I haven't tried this in for real, unfortunately, so I don't know how well it works. But, uh, but also, if you do this, uh, there are no serialization of parameters. So if you pass uh, parameters between threads, you need to be make sure that uh, the parameters are available when the thread gets them, can use them. So if you delete objects and stuff like that, it will blow up. So, so it's not like in Qt where you actually serialize the objects and put them in a message queue and then you're free to do whatever you want, like copying. This you have also manage yourself here. Uh, yeah, that's what I said about this thread in the Um So Synop basically solves the same problems as the signal 2. So I, I don't really see how they... They have a lot of different arguments between signals 2 and the Synops, which, is, uh, which they think is the strength. Um, but as stated with Synos 2 is more even simpler and more robust than Synos 2 is a little bit in development still, I would say. Um, but this thread handling that they have incorporated, that could be a positive thing, I think. Um, yeah? That's basically what we had to say. Okay. So to conclude, I mean, you have uh, there are abstractions that you don't have to implement this kind of callback interface mechanism yourself, that's good. But still, Qt is kind of a bigger, but on the other hand, better, I would say, in many cases, because you get more. Yeah, but it enforces you to do mm. more things. And for instance, you <laughs> can't do the return values and so on. There is actually a project, I mean, when Qt 5 came, C++ 11 was sort of coming, that, that strives to build Qt without the mock. Uh, I think it's called Vertigris. Vertigris, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, I haven't looked at it for years. I mean, it, it's getting there, and there's talk about Qt 6, and sort of the standard has become more mature, and the compilers mm -hmm. all support more and more than C++. Uh, yeah, because that kind of be a drawback, basically. They have added these kind of keywords, like saying that's the slots and so on. Yeah, just I mean, then they're moved in the mock. But uh, would that be necessary today? I mean, can they use other mechanisms to do the same no, thing? No, and then it's about backwards compatibility, I guess. Yeah, because no. yeah, you can basically take the source code from something written in Qt 1 and with relatively small modifications make it build in, in Qt 5. So the concepts are, are true all the way through. So, mm. so if you want to change signals and slots, on a foundational level, I guess it's harder. But I mean, with Qt 6, they, they use semantic versioning, so if you go from 5 to 6, they can actually have an API breakage. And I think this is this is definitely on the list. It's the same as the the containers that they have. They're, they've approached the SDL containers more and more as the SDA, SDL implementations have become more and more mature. Uh, I mean, Qt's original selling point was to be cross-platform. <coughs> uh, so if you want to be funny, you can say that everything strange in Qt can be derived to Visual Studio 6. But it's not 100% true, but a lot comes from the limitations of like mid and late 90s uh, compilers, basically, and trying to make sure that the code could actually be rebuilt across platforms. Uh, some design choices were made based on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the links uh, thingy, reference. Yeah. yeah. Also. Uh, so there's the link to the Boost in these particular libraries and also to the Qt project thingy. Yeah. And I guess we share the slides with the clickable links in the meetup group or yeah. somewhat like that. Yeah. Um, and you're all on the camera, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Yeah. Yeah. So that's basically what we. Questions. Everyone's happy. Yeah, yeah, really. Thank you for coming. Thank you.